Safer Chemicals Podcast. Sound science on harmful chemicals. Stakeholders are very important in the work of the committee. We might have different goals, uh, we might have different agendas, but at the end of the day, we all have the same passion for science, for a scientific and technically robust opinion. This is why I value very much their input in the work of the committee. ECAS committees are making every effort to advance the opinion making on the proposed restriction on PFAS. We will be assessing the proposed restriction and also the comments received in the consultation and we'll be looking at things in batches, so looking at all the different sectors that uh, will be uh, affected by the restriction. We have now uh, some good planning until September and as the work progresses we will be providing more information about what comes after that. Welcome back to the Safer Chemicals podcast. I'm Adam Elwan, and I am joined by the chair of our risk assessment committee, Roberto Scazzola, and the chair of our socioeconomic analysis committee, Maria Otati. Roberto and Maria just finished their March meetings, and we have quite a lot of interesting topics to talk about. So they'll be updating us on the universal PFAS restriction proposal. We'll also talk with Maria about an updated approach for the socioeconomic analysis committee to recommend review periods in their opinions on applications for authorization. Roberto will be sharing the committee's conclusions on the harmonized classification of three lithium salts. This opinion follows a request from the Commission to review an existing risk assessment committee opinion in light of a new study. Maria and Roberto will also talk us through the current state of play and next steps with the opinions on authorizing the continued use of chromium-6 compounds in the aeronautics and defense industries. Good to have you both here for the first time this year. Nice to be here, Adam. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right, before we start going through the committee discussions, I understand you are looking for more members, is that correct? That's correct. In addition to having members who are nominated or member states, both committees, or rather each committee, can also what we call co-opt five extra members. That means bringing members in and appointing them based on their expertise. So we're looking for new candidates that we can consider for their co-opted memberships. And we've just opened on the 6th of March uh, the call. And uh, yes, I think Roberto can tell you more. Yes, indeed, uh, Maria, you're right. We have candidatures that are open until 8th of April, and you can find more information on the expertise we are looking for on ECA website. So we are really inviting everyone that is interested to join us. We, we need you. All right. Thanks a lot. That's a good message to our listeners. So check the ECA website if you're interested in that. Well, let's then move on to PFAS. So this is the proposal to restrict approximately 10,000 PFAS in the EU and EEA. Um, the restriction aims to address their persistent nature, uh, contaminating water sources and causing toxic accumulation in people, animals, and also in plants. So with potential health risks and widespread environmental releases from industrial and consumer uses, this proposal led by Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, and Sweden, is now under evaluation by our committees. So the committees have agreed to carry out their opinion-making now in batches, uh, addressing the different sectors that are potentially impacted. In their March meetings, they discussed PFAS in consumer mixtures, cosmetics, and ski wax. Roberto, what can you tell us about the discussions in the Risk Assessment Committee? Thank you, Adam. Indeed, this restriction has a very broad scope. There is a high number of substances, and this is why the committees have both decided to look into these into sectors in a way that we can look to the information in a coherent and homogeneous manner. And this includes the input that has been provided during the consultation. Particularly, Iraq had a look at volumes of PFAS that are produced in the different sectors related emissions, but also the measures that are in place to control them. These elements are very important because they constitute the basis of a restriction and they will allow the committee to decide whether the restriction is the right measure to be taken into account in the regulatory process. Uh, for March, I think we also had discussion indeed on the three specific sectors that you have mentioned. And I would like to flag the very wide interest that uh, stakeholders had. We had about the double of stakeholders attending the meeting, about 120 instead of the usual 60 to 70. So, and this is also to flag the importance of having them. Stakeholders are very important for a robust opinion making process. So I, I definitely value their input into the process. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I also understand that you discussed the hazards of PFAS. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And it, that's the basis of the restriction. And in a way, the main issue here at stake is about persistency. So it means that those, this group of substances, they tend to stay in the environment for a very long period of time. 
And so they have the ability to, to take to stock, to increase. And of course, this has a, a direct uh, link to the potential exposure for human health and the environment. There are also additional hazards that are of concern. This includes their mobility, so the fact that they can move across the environment, but also their toxicity or even global warming potential. They can accumulate in plants. There are some of those substances that have an effect on the hum- immune system or about the reprotoxicity. And it's maybe relevant to mention that at the same meeting, the committee decided to uh, issue an opinion for a harmonized classification of one of those substances that has a very severe classification for reprotoxicity, so the possibility to affect the fertility and development. RAC therefore evaluated all available evidence and reached some provisional conclusions on the potential risks related to the use manufacturing of those substances. And discussion will now continue in the June plenary where we will approach different sectors and additional discussion on hazard will also take place. Um, maybe then moving on to you, Maria, what were the highlights from the socioeconomic side? Well, similarly to RAC, we also discussed PFAS in the three specific sectors that you you have mentioned. So we started out by looking at the situation regarding alternatives on those sectors. So are there safer alternatives available to PFAS? And based on the conclusions that we drew on that, uh, we looked at the cost and the benefits of implementing a ban in these sectors and also at whether it would be proportionate to do so. Um, But in addition to the sectors, we also discussed what we call the general approach. So this relates to how SEAC is going to evaluate all these different elements of the restriction proposal for each sector is more a little overarching discussion, I would say. Uh, So the restriction report, they are presenting qualitative criteria to evaluate the costs, the benefits, and also the proportionality of uh, each sector in the proposal. Uh, And SEAC discussed these criteria and how we would implement them in the evaluation of the different sectors. So the discussion on the general approach, in addition to this, will also cover many different aspects of the proposal. For instance, how... uh, potential restriction can be enforced, how it can be monitored. And that discussion is not finished. This will definitely continue in following plenaries as we go along. Uh, Now, regarding the sector discussions, we will come back to these sectors in June. Uh, We have more information on the waste stage that was provided by the dossier submitter uh, in the latest update of the proposal and also some more information about uses in cosmetics. This we were not able to discuss in the March meeting, so we will be looking at that in in the June ones. Right. Okay. So continuing that then in June with additional information that you've received. All right. Um, And I'm sure many of our listeners are also eager to hear about the next steps with this restriction. So is there anything that you can say about that? In June, we plan to discuss the metal plating and manufacture of metal products sector. And of course, RAC will continue discussing on hazards. Yeah. And in September, we aim to focus on textiles, upholstery, leather, apparel and carpets. That's uh, is a wider sector we called uh, TULAC. Also on food contact materials and packaging, which listeners with good memories may remember we also talked about a few months ago as well, and also on petroleum and mining. And I would also like to remark that we are truly making every effort to progress the opinion making as quickly as possible. Of course, we are dependent on the updates on the proposal that was made by the five original national authorities. And you can be reassured, we will deliver the final opinions to the European Commission in the shortest possible time frame, while, of course, ensuring transparency, independence and the good quality. And as the work advances, we will be able to provide more information about what we're planning to do and what we're planning to evaluate uh, later in, in future plenaries when we're planning to evaluate the remaining sectors. And we will continue to communicate this in conjunction with the future committee meetings. The information will be available also on our website. So good. We'll be talking about this topic in many of our episodes. I'm sure we will. Yes. All right. So next we'll then be talking about lithium salts and how they're classified and labeled. This process, known as harmonized classification and labeling, aims to consistently identify and communicate the hazards of chemicals across the EU. Now, in 2021, the Risk Assessment Committee recommended labeling lithium carbonate, lithium chloride, and lithium hydroxide as harmful to fertility, unborn children, and breastfed babies. However, after this decision, a new study uh, suggested that there might not be a clear link between lithium use during pregnancy and heart defects in unborn babies. Roberto, your committee has now reviewed the new study and formed its opinion on it, right? 
Yes, indeed, this is correct. And everything started back in 2021, uh, once the committee adopted an opinion on reprotoxicity based on a proposal made by the French authorities. And then following the adoption of the opinion, industry provided new information on an additional publication concerning the epidemiology of this relatively rare cardiac fetal malformation, and as well an analysis of the related publication. So industry was somewhat challenging this causal link between the exposure during pregnancies and the related cardiac malformation that was covered with the RAC opinion. As a result of this, European Commission requested RAC to come back on this point and to check whether the opinion would uh, deserve any update. So we had a consultation last year in 2023, and it was very positive because we got also additional studies that were not initially there, and they were looked at by the committee. Based on this new information, the committee discussed at the last plenary and reached a conclusion confirming the previous classification for reprotoxicity category 1A. And I think what is interesting to note is that in 2021, there was a minority opinion because a RAC member could not agree on that decision. But now with the new elements taken into account, there was no minority opinion. And I'm very glad to say that we reach an opinion by consensus. And that's always a very good result for a committee. What that happens next, um, as lithium is used in the battery sector, so I expect that this industry sector is quite concerned about the outcome of the classification? Thank you, Adam. I think you're right. This group of substances might play an important role into the manufacturing of batteries, but I would like to highlight that it's not the role of this committee to look into the socioeconomic considerations, contrary to our sister committee that they look into, into this. We truly look into the intrinsic hazardous properties. Um, I would also like to mention that we consult stakeholders and we receive very important input. So uh, we took into account all potential elements related to the intrinsic hazardous properties. And now it's up to the European Commission. The moment the opinion will be sent to them, they will look into it, they will discuss it with member states and will decide whether a classification is deserved and then be inserted into the related regulation. All right, so we're then waiting for the commission to take the next steps with this one um, and to consider, obviously, the, the RAC opinion uh, in its decision making. So, Maria, then, you had some news about the committee's updated approach to recommend review periods in opinions for applications for authorizations. Um, we touched on this topic already last year uh, when the updating process started in the committee. And now this document has been adopted, right? Yeah, exactly. We kicked off the process in September and we adopted an updated approach now in the March meeting. And can you remind us what exactly a review period is? Uh, Yeah, well, all authorizations to use substances of very high concern are time limited and they will need to then be reviewed when the authorization is about to close, assuming that the company hasn't actually substituted uh, before then. Uh, So the end date is set when the authorization is granted by the commission and they take into account the opinion of RAC and SEAC to be able to determine when the, the, the end date should be. So the review process helps to ensure that the use of substances of concern is regularly monitored and to push companies towards safer alternatives, right? Yeah, exactly. So setting this time-limited authorization is really important to achieve substitution and to incentivize substitution. Uh, But it's also important to monitor the use of SVHCs or substances of very high concern and also to check whether the authorization is justified based on the latest scientific knowledge because obviously the progress of uh, the state of alternatives changes throughout the year. So it's important to check that periodically. Okay, so why was an update needed? Well, so the idea of having a paper in the first place is to be very transparent to the outside world as to what we take into account when we make this recommendation. So those who are actually applying for authorization then can make sure they give us the information that we need. Now, we already have a paper, but that's quite an old one. And there have been many developments in both the uh, opinion and decision making processes. For instance, we don't really incorporate uh, the existence of substitution plans very much in the old approach. So that was one element that we needed to bring in, as well as different uh, practices that have developed over the years. So we want to make it very clear as to how this uh, recommendation is being taken in the committee. Thank you. And how does then the Socioeconomic Analysis Committee determine the length of the recommended review periods? Is there a clear guideline on this? Well, the idea is that The starting point for our recommendation is going to be the substitution timeline that the applicant proposes. So we're basically going to be basing our recommendation on how long do we think it will take to achieve substitution. So the applicant provides us with uh, 
substitution timeline and justifications, and SEAC will consider whether that is uh, something that is justified. So we will look at many different elements. There's a list of elements that SEAC may consider. Of course, it's all case by case because all the cases are different. So we may look at things like the coherence and consistency of the information provided, the milestones and how well justified they are, uh, the issues around the economic feasibility of alternatives. I won't go through all of them. They're all very clearly set out in the paper. So now, if SEA considers that the applicant has justified properly the what they're requesting, then we will recommend that. However, if we consider that they haven't, then that's what we call, uh, that's when what we call the default review periods come in. So for instance, they ask for 10 years and they haven't justified it, SEAC will recommend seven, which is the shorter review period, as long as that's justified, of course. So that practice was not very clear in the previous paper, and we now want to make it very transparent. It sounds like a good update that will help both the applicants to understand better what they need to submit, but then also for the committees to get more structured and relevant information, basically, for the applications. Indeed, that's the idea. All right. So the document will then soon be available on our website where you can have a look at the logic behind recommending a review period. Now, before we close, I wanted to ask you about the opinions from both committees on applications for authorization for Chromium 6 uses, in particular in aviation and defense. This is a large number of initial applications and review reports managed by the Aerospace and Defense Chromates Reauthorization Consortium, or ADCR for short. That's why we need an acronym, right? <laughs> That's <laughs> Absolutely, such a never enough acronyms. <laughs> You're right. Indeed, this concerns uh, the aviation and the defense industry, and the application cover over 20 uses uh, related to hundreds of sites across Europe. It's about coating and plating with chromium-6 substances to provide a number of properties, including corrosion, wear, and heat protection, but also electrical conductivity. However, these compounds, they might display carcinogen properties, and this is mainly to workers. This is why we need to exerts particular care when we use them. And that's basically the purpose of the authorization process. Yeah, so we had lots of different uses covered in this batch of applications. And uh, as Roberto mentioned, it covered many different types of uses going from pre-treatments, the actual plating, and then post-treatment. So I won't go into the, into the detail. You can find all that on, on our website. And as a reminder, as always, when we do applications for authorization, there's a possibility to go back to the applicant and ask questions. And we did that as well. We took full advantage of the possibility to get all the uh, clarity about information and uh, any extra information that they may have. Okay, that's definitely useful to have a back and forth and an iterative process and to get input also based on the comments. All right, so what happens next? Well, the opinions are now agreed by Rack and SEAC, which uh, is a little bit of a technical thing, but it means that they are agreed, not yet adopted. So what happens in the middle is that we send the opinions to the applicants. The applicants right. decide if they want to comment or not. And if they do, we look at the comments, we consider them in both committees. And if necessary, we amend the opinions based on that and they come back to the plenaries where they would be adopted. If the applicant decides not to comment, then the opinions become adopted um, automatically. Right. So there is still a chance for applicants to comment even at this stage. Yeah. In the application for authorization process, there's always a chance to comment on the draft opinions. Uh, and then, of course, the final decision is taken by the commission. All right. That's all the time we have for today. Uh, thank you once again for your explanations and insight into the committee work. Now, the next committee meetings then take place in June of this year. So tune in again then for the latest updates. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Safer Chemicals Podcast. Sound science on harmful chemicals.